the world and the going on in the world and what the world tries to do in coming up with answers and what God has already done. Starting at verse 19 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter down through 21. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Beloved, Peter has set up for us a point of contrast, and it's important that we understand this contrast. It is the believer as set apart from the world and in contrast to those who belong the world This idea of contrast follows in line with uh, creator-creature distinction that must always be maintained in terms of authority, in terms of who we worship, in terms of everything about life. And so Peter is emphasizing this, and I want us to emphasize it. I want us to remember it because, it's, because it is very important. On the one hand, we have the imagination of men's hearts expressed by cleverly devised tales and myths. Now, you might not hear something today regarding uh, Greek mythology, for instance. I doubt there are very few that, that uh, use Homer as their Bible and embrace Greek mythology. But in your conversations with other people, you might hear something like, well, I think that the world is, and what are they doing? From their own imagination, they are creating a reality of how they think the world ought to be. But it is not given to the creature to create a world that he thinks ought to be, but to acknowledge the creator of the world and to worship him and bow before him. And so on the one hand, cleverly devised tales and myths, and it can take different kinds of forms today. <clears throat> be aware of that. Be aware of that. On the other hand, we have the revelation of God that we have talked about. The revelation of God that makes knowledge possible. To know anything at all, God is the precondition of everything else. To make sense out of life and the world, our place in it, and so forth. He makes knowledge possible. It makes getting on in this world possible. And it makes understanding this creation possible. The reason why the unbeliever can do science and look at things and come to some form of understanding about the world is because the God who is behind it all. Because even the unbeliever bears, in part, bears the image of God, is an image bearer still fulfilling the cultural mandate of subduing all things. He just doesn't do it to God's glory while the believer does. It's an important thing for us to remember. It makes understanding our place in this world possible. You're left with the imagination of the human heart or what God says about this world. And if we are wrestling with our place in the world, our identity, who we should be, how we should be, if God is out of the picture, it's left to everyone's opinion. 
And, of course, you've heard the phrase, well, my opinion is just as valid as your opinion. And if you don't have a solid foundation upon which to stand, meaning the revelation of God, then, of course, it's true. And we make our own way in the world by being our own little gods. Now we have seen Peter very concerned that we pay attention to it. The prophetic word, pay attention to the prophetic word, beloved. Why? Because the world has a murky darkness to it. It's not just the absence of illumination. It's dark because there's crud in the world. There's sin in the world. And you can't see clearly through all the mock unless you have a special light. It has a substance to it. It's almost so thick you can slice it with a knife and you can, can sort of observe this murkiness. And in order to see appropriately, one must have the proper kind of light. It's a kind of light that must be able to pierce this darkness. It must be able to penetrate through the darkness that is the world to shine the light of the glory of God upon it so that we might indeed know him and know our place in the world and live for him and do his will. And it must be something that we pay attention to. Pay attention to it as, as a light in a dark place, in a murky place. That allows me to see where I'm going, that clears the path that I trod. That I might travel appropriately. Which is to say, we need to take it to heart, right? We need to take to heart the word of God in all its fullness. And it must serve as our sole means of guidance and be our interpreter. How do I know how to view the world? How do I know how to interpret the goings on around me? Riots and protests and government overreach or government underreach or whatever it might be and our place in the world and and earning a living and raising children and all of that together god interprets it for us so that we might have understanding that we might honor him that we might make our way through a darkened world beloved So where in Peter's thinking is he leading us? He is leading us to think about that time when the potent light of Christ will shine forth into the world, dispelling the murky darkness. It is an anticipation of sorts. It's an anticipation both of an objective and subjective experience, the return of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. It is an objective experience because it will happen. It is matter of fact. It is a subjective experience because we will indeed be there. We will experience it in one way, shape, or form. And how I experience it might not be how you experience it, but that's not a bad thing. It's just because we're individuals and we're different. But Peter tells us to pay attention to this prophetic word in these murky times, looking forward to what lies ahead. 
And Jesus, our Lord, is both the morning star and the day that will dawn in the world and arise in our hearts. Remember the morning star, Venus? You can see it just before daybreak, before it fully comes to fruition. Pay attention to that because it's coming and one day it will be upon us. And I know people probably look out in the world and they see the virus and they see the riots and they think Jesus is overdue. No, he's not overdue. He comes in the moment of God's plan. And it might be beyond our lives. I'm of an age now where, where uh, I can remember those who were older and much older than I was saying, I believe Jesus is coming in my lifetime. And I wish it were true. It would have been true. Uh, but we've had funerals after funeral after funeral. We trust in our Lord in this day and age. We fulfill our responsibilities. We honor him. We pay attention to the light that he has given to us in this age. And we wait for Jesus, the morning star. And that day will dawn in our hearts. It is in that day that the light of Jesus will shine and give us clarity in a murky, dark world in its fullest measure. That is, in terms of how much a human being can really understand. When Jesus comes, we will have better understanding than we do now. But our understanding, beloved, comes from that light that is here now, the light of the Word of God, as it is ministered to us and to our hearts. And it is a powerful light. And it is such a powerful light that it can penetrate the darkness. But not only that, Peter says that it will arise in our hearts. What I think he's getting at here is that the knowledge of the Lord and the light of the Lord will illuminate our hearts so that we may see things as they are. The more we get to know his word and understand it, the more we see things as they are. And when the fullness of the living word appears and comes again, we will see in greater clarity and fullness the way things are. And so now we pose another question, asking whose interpretation do we follow? Whose interpretation do we follow? And this question gets at two important points. The first point has to do with how we handle the scriptures themselves. In other words, are we allowed to simply form our own interpretation of the scriptures apart from any known procedures that have been handed down to us through the years in the church? One of my pet peeves is reading into the scriptures. Reading into the scriptures contemporary settings and contemporary ideas and forcing them into the scriptures and bringing forth an interpretation by actually reading into it and saying, well, of course this means this. How are we to handle it? You may have even heard debates or have had discussions or conversations with others and it's reduced to such things as well that's just your interpretation in other words that's just your opinion 
Again, are we stuck with mere opinion about things? Or do we have clarity? Does God speak with clarity? And beloved, I would say that he does. And any mistakes that are made rest upon us and not upon him. It rests upon us and our own failings, not upon him and, and how murky he might have been in communicating to us. He communicates faithfully always. I think we get into trouble when we wish certain things and we take our wishes and read them into scripture. That's just your interpretation. Are we to throw up our hands and say, is there anything that we can arrive at? The second point with which we have to do is related to how we go about interpreting reality, ultimate commitments and our place in the world. Stories can be fun things. But when stories become myth and legend to convey truth, are we allowed our own interpretation of things? Are we allowed to skew what's going on to the world to fit our preconceived notions of things? It's a difficulty. It's something that we are currently struggling with today in our own society. How are we to understand history? How are we to understand comments that people have made way in the past? And, and do, we, do we come along with a, with a, a magic marker crossing out everything we don't agree with? Do we seek to eliminate it all, or do we seek to try and understand it within its historical context? In the development of society and views and beliefs and, and, and striving to the ideals that are set forth. A corollary to this has to do with receiving and communicating truth. And so now the question before us has to do with the weight we give to fables or myths or legends or tales or the scriptures. Remember when we started this back in verse 16, we, we began wondering to ourselves, are they weighted the same? And the world seeks to wait the fables of the world, Greek mythology, Norse mythology, whatever it might be, with the scriptures, and they are brought to the same level. All you have is just another fable or myth. What weight do we give to it? And so now remember, Peter is very concerned about leaving something for the church, leaving behind something for the church, and making sure that the church has something firm and sure so that they might remember the important teachings of our Lord through the apostles, the prophets, and the commandment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the apostles. And I believe Peter is alluding to the fact that there will be a written document or documents by the apostolic authority that is then given to the church. It is passed on, the apostolic tradition, in written form for us to embrace, for us to learn from, to submit to, to gain understanding of what God is up to and what he has done and accomplished. 
So much so that what Peter has said, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. You see, without the prophetic word, we would not know the way of life. We would all, every one of us, be damned. Do you understand that? And it is because the light of this word that pierces the darkness can show us the way of life. As the apostles reflected upon the words of Jesus and they said, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of life. We don't need more words that lead to further corruption and eventually death and separation from God. And so we have the prophetic word, the more sure prophetic word that brings us into the way of life. And Peter knew that in his day, the church had to deal with cleverly devised tales. Peter was dealing with it that sought to undermine the apostolic authority. Again, level, leveling it off instead of, instead of leaving the distinction between them. And Peter is writing, in effect, to demonstrate the difference between them, that is, the imagination of men and the revelation of God. In terms of authority, ultimate commitments, and the manner in which the truth of God is conveyed. And we're going to get there and look at it more carefully and how it is that we are able to trust in his word. And so Peter says in verse 20, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Peter wants us to understand at the forefront of all things or the chief of everything else is that when you look at prophecy in the writings, it is not as a result of one's own interpretation of things going on. It's not a result of one's own explanation of things. And so let's tackle the phrase, Prophecy of Scripture, first of all. What is he referring to when he speaks of the prophecy of Scripture? Well, again, some interpreters in Peter uh, limit this phrase to those prophetic utterances or writings speaking of the coming of Christ. After all, chapter 3, as we alluded to before, has to do with the coming of our Lord. And, they, and so the emphasis is upon that. Some view it as specific scriptures speaking of the first advent of our Lord, his whole life and so on. But I would suggest, beloved, that it is more basic than that that Peter is arguing more basic than that. I think Peter is arguing in terms of what is fundamental to every prophecy when eventually written down and what we have today. And so if we maintain the contrast between the cleverly devised tales and what Peter is going to provide the church after his departure, then he must be referring to that which comes through the apostolic witness in written form and what we hold in our hands today, at least a translation of it. Now when we add the next phrase after it, so that we read in full that no prophecy of Scripture is of one's own interpretation, we need to ask again, what is Peter getting at? 
And some use this as a defense to argue that personal interpretation is forbidden in the scripture. Some cults do that. Mormonism does that. They'll often say, insofar as it is translated correctly. Insofar as it is interpreted correctly, this is the word of God. Meaning, if you don't agree with our interpretation and that of Joseph Smith and the other presidents of the Mormon church, then you're wrong. You're not given to your own interpretation. The Roman Catholic Church would tend to view it this way, saying that interpretation is a matter not of private interpretation, but a matter of church, of church teaching and tradition. That is, that which comes to us through the magisterium of the church. And because they give the teaching, we are then to receive that teaching and understand what we read in light of that teaching. We're not supposed to open our Bibles and look at it and seek to understand it on our own. That's their view. And so I think that it misses the point. However, I have a little caveat here. It is true that we are not supposed to give scripture our own interpretation. Okay, again, I think we all do it from time to time, taking something modern and reading into it, especially in terms of prophecy, that happens a lot. Taking modern thinking, the modern way of looking at things and reading into it. But instead, what are we to do? Well, we're to draw out exegesis, draw out from the scriptures the meaning of the text. What did Peter mean by using these words? What did Paul the apostle mean by using these words? It affects us today in terms of our constitution. Some hold the view that we are supposed to look at the constitution in terms of what the framers meant by what they said. And others say, no, we can't do that. We have to read into it modern experiences and then work it out in the Constitution. So we still fight with that kind of thing. How do we interpret documents? How do we interpret these things? And what I learned in seminary, what I learned at the feet of others, is that it is the original intent of the author, as much as you can. Understand what Paul means. Understand what Matthew means. What did he mean by these words? Well, another way of looking at all of this has to do with what Peter was up against. Certainly he was fighting against those who present cleverly devised tales to the church, who took great liberty in incorporating myth into the church or taking what was already there and twisting it into cleverly devised tales. And so another view espouses that those who promulgated cleverly devised tales were twisting the scriptures to their own ends. That is, they were giving their own interpretation to them or to their, to their own understanding of God and the world around them. Well, this is what it must mean because this is how we understand it now. And so Peter is arguing that the revelation of God and its interpretation are of the same cloth. And above all, it cannot be twisted to one's own ends.
We look forward to the personal return of Christ in splendor and glory and, and power. It will be at that time when the morning star rises and the day dawns in its fullness. However, God has given to us his glorious word, which is able to pierce the darkness right now. We can have and are able to have understanding right now. We don't have to wait to the fullness of when Christ comes. But in handling this more sure prophetic word, it is not left to us to handle it according to our own imaginations. It's not left to us to look at the goings on around us and say, well, this is what it must mean according to today. Rather, we must correctly handle the word of God to effectively have a sure grounding, chapter 1, to have a sure grounding and handle the darkness and effectively deal with the teachings of false teachers. And already we are anticipating chapter 2 when Peter now, once he has us grounded in the faith, now we're able to turn our attention in chapter 2 to false teachers and understand what they seek to do to undermine the revelation of God and the truth of his word. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to us. For being our guide and for sending us such a powerful light that it might pierce the darkness around us and that we might know how to understand the things around us. And so we give you the glory and praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we close our time together, remember offering uh, buckets, crates, whatever, you, boxes in the back, in the foyer. Meeting after church, we'll just meet right here. We are going to stand together singing, The Master Has Come.